Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The next to the last guest, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're so touchy you can't stand to have the finger put on you, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Uh, my dear Valentine, in 70-some-odd years of varied experience, I have found that it is often harder to do a good thing than a bad one. The world seldom appreciates an unusual gesture of kindness, but I am a stubborn old man, and I intend to make one such gesture. It concerns the distribution of my modest fortune. In other words, the provisions of my will. I need the help of a good and honest, honest man, man to carry on after my death. I have checked on you well, Valentine, but my time is running out. Please visit me immediately in Suite 14A, Hotel McKinley Arms. It's signed, uh, Todd Stern. Mm-hmm. Let me see that. Yeah. McKinley Arms. Hey, Angel, I think that's the place... Oh, George, that... of course. The one with the gargoyles along the roof and the old ironwork up over the door. Yeah, 4th Street, sure. They're tearing it down to make room for a super drugstore. Well, what are we waiting for, Angel? Let's go visit the past. Before, as Mr. Sturman puts it, time runs up. I thought at least the elevators would still be working. Chin up, Angel. 14A should be right down here. Well, exercise is for youngsters. Only, how do you suppose an old man like Mr. Stern... Maybe he doesn't, Brooksy. Maybe he just hibernates up here. Uh Uncle! Get out! Uncle, you don't have to throw things. I only said... Get out of here. You and your visit. It's my duty, Uncle. Like a ghoul or a vulture come to see if the carrion started rotting yet. Well, I'm still fit. You see that, don't you? Still fit. I'm glad you're so healthy, Uncle. But you do have to move somewhere. And I only suggested this room in my house for you. Oh, uh, uh, Francis, you're about as subtle as a stick of dynamite. But I'm not going to oblige you by getting angry again and bursting a blood oh, vessel. Here he comes. This is it, Angel. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Mr. Sturman? <laughs> Bet you got an earful, didn't you, Valentine? Well, yeah. Oh! Don't look so shocked, Francis. I'd fire anyone who wouldn't admit me like to eavesdrop. Oh, that infernal racket. I hate noise. Come in. Come in, Miss Brooke. Yeah, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I want you both to meet my nearest living relative, Miss Francis O'Neill. How do you do? Hello, Miss O'Neill. Oh. Uh, do you work for Uncle? Do you? I should have said my most curious and tenacious relative, shouldn't I? It's none of your affair, Francis. What do you do, Mr. Valentine? What's your business? Francis, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. It is dreadful of me to be upset by just a material thing. But the hotel is being torn literally from under his feet, you know. Oh, but there, enough of that. You and I, my dear, can have a nice little gossip, can't we? While the two men talk about their business. We won't do this at all. Will we, my dear? Will we? Francis. Yes, Uncle. Goodbye, everyone. Tragic. They call her poor Francis. She fell in love once, 20 years ago, and the man turned out to be no good. She's lived on sympathy she gets ever since. Her position, social standing, everything depends on it. Poor dead memories. Poor Francis. Well, Mr. Sturman, when we were out in the hallway, you didn't sound quite so friendly to her. I'm just a cranky old man, that's all. <laughs> yeah, it's this blasted hammering yesterday, I suppose. You know, I was the first guest to take a suite in this hotel 42 years ago. I just made my first 10000 I bought a Chalmers, and the stable boy kept the lamps polished for me out back. Well, from the looks of things, you'll be about the last one to leave, too. Yeah, I have until this afternoon. Forty-two years. But the management's been very kind. Very kind. And then where are you going? 
It's none of your business either, Valentine. Okay, Mr. Sturman. You hired me to handle something about your will, so let's hear it. Uh, you're right. Enough of sentiment. Here. Here, I'll show you. Uh-huh. Stocks? Securities, some bonds, a few foreign things. About three quarters of a million. Oh, you've done all right. Yeah, I just set it up here checking it to make sure I divided it right. Oh, that's a pretty big piece of pie. How are you cutting it up? Mr. Valentine, I watch people the way I've watched you. <laughs> it's about the only pleasure left to an old man. Go on. There's a little accountant, for instance. Never been anything but little, never anything but honest. He worked for me once years ago. Now I see he has heavy responsibilities, a large family, many debts. His name is Henry Freeholder. And you're going to give him happiness. Nonsense, nonsense. The next is an ex-pug named Kid McClinton. A pug? A man, Miss Brooks. I saw his one big fight and I enjoyed it. Since then, I've watched him, too. Yeah? McClintock runs a little bar in a tough section, but he doesn't drink. Sort of a popular hero with even the delinquent kids of his neighborhood. He's ignorant, poor, but very proud. Uh, another worthy case. Money should go where money is deserved. Anyway, yesterday I wrote letters to both men. But I want you to make sure they understand what I'm doing. And make sure they understand that whenever my will is probated, you will be there to scrap for them. With legal help. Publicity. Everything. Well, just who do I scrap with? Who's got a chip on his shoulder? The third equal-sized piece of pie. Francis. Oh, but if you're giving her a shame. Only because of her little tragedy, I assure you. Oh, but she wouldn't interfere. Where money is concerned, everyone interferes. There's no one who's immune. Why do you think she's so curious? Why do you think she makes all these duty calls? I tell you, when people see money, their eyes shrink and turn black. Even why she ones like Francis. And their souls creep into a dark place to offer themselves for sale. Okay, Mr. Sturman, okay. We'll slap on the price control. So give me the addresses of those men and we'll get going. Just remember, Valentine. Be careful. Watch yourself. And, uh, <laughs> never underestimate the power of a woman. Jack, working on the books. Bartender said we'd find you up here. You are Mr. McKendrick, aren't you? Everybody knows the kid lady, but it's the end of the month. I don't add so good. Oh, I don't like to keep accounts either. My name's Valentine. Yeah, real pleasure to make your acquaintance, Jack. Now beat it. <laughs> okay, hang on to your red ink, Buster. Why? I come from Todd Sturman. Is he dead yet? No. Step to one side, lady. Oh, oh. 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 Hit the road, Jack. Hey. George! George, oh. are you all right? Yeah, sure, sure, like a test pilot in a punching bag. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. Kid's got a pretty good list, ain't he? <laughs> oh, why don't you shut up? Bartender, give me a glass of water. Uh, here you are, miss. <laughs> On the house. <laughs> hey, what's the matter with that boot baboon up there? Here, George, dearie. <laughs> Forget this, will you? I'm going back. I'm a fix that. <laughs> you done, kid? The tourist here don't know his tonsils from his teeth. Shut up, Archie. Okay, Buster, I'm ready for another waltz. Jack, Jack, please. I'm sorry. Don't be sore at the kid. Don't be sore I done that. Oh, no, I love you for it. You couldn't fight with me. I'm good, see? Look at the picture there. You're the one over the bar. That's Tiger Jensen himself, the champ. And I knock him out in three rounds, see? Everybody knows how tough I am. That temper must have done you a lot of good in the ring. I ain't got a temper. I'm a popular guy. Even the boys like me. They look up to the old kid. It's the money that's all. Yeah, what about the money? Jack, did you ever need money and know you're going to get it some? Only you don't know when. You keep hoping, only you're a heel for hoping. You know what I mean? Maybe. Well, that's all it was, I swear to you. I'm upset, that's all, and now it's all over, see? Now, now, please, let the kid buy you a drink, huh? Come on, both of you. Hey, hey, set him up, Louis. Thanks. Thanks. We got other business to attend to. Let's go. Please. There's a free drink any time in the house, Jack. God, George, what goes on? You can't to talk to him about his getting a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, I don't know, Angel. But I wonder what an account makes it up. Hey, somebody's in a hurry. Yeah, they've been parked here. George, it was a woman. 
was Francis. Yeah, Francis. Come on, Brooksy, we're in a hurry, too. Hey, what's that guy's name? Freeholder? Yeah. Hey, taxi! Mrs. Freeholder, you said your husband left only a moment ago. If you could just tell us when he'll be back. He won't ever be back. Not to this house. Not if I can stop him. <laughs> oh, well, we're sorry. We didn't understand. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. We've always been a respectable family. We've had our little trouble, but we've always managed somehow. We have our position in the community. Henry, treasurer of the church. Well, look, what's happened, Mrs. Freeholder? I... I can't tell you. It's none of my affair any longer. You'd have to see Henry. You don't know where he is. Said too much already. I'm leaving in a few moments for a little trip with the children and there's lunch to prepare. Oh, you might try... Well, he, he was going someplace downtown to meet a woman telephone. A woman? Somebody named Frances O'Neill, something like that. Mrs. Freeholder... The reason for your upset has to do with money, doesn't it? No, no, it doesn't. It has to do with money and an old gentleman named Todd Stump. Get out of here! Father, you don't let me that man's name here! We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Tomorrow summer, according to the calendar, and if you'd like to get top set or switch to that great Chevy Supreme gasoline, or it's a pen of tailored, tailored to the season of the year and to each different temperament of tailored. And in the wet, means blended for faster start, getaway in traffic, count on it to get the best out of your car. All the power your car was designed for Supreme. You'll find you can't buy it to drive this summer. Go on, Chevron Depression Engine. Just try a tank full of Chevron Supreme tomorrow. Get it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations, where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Under which heading dollars come, good or bad, to downstairs that weeps on your ship. Another beneficiary, a timid little woman, is either following you or preceding you everywhere you go, and not in a timid fashion. A third beneficiary you can't even find. Yes, it's beginning to look like money is the root of all evil. But if you're anything like George Valentine, you suspect that there may be other roots, too. Now, look, it's not such a big job, Lieutenant. Just check on the histories of these people, that's all. Look, Lieutenant, you've got the machinery. Your fire boys can check their own stuff fast, and the records of the boxing commission are Okay, all... okay, stop bribing me. I'm interested. There's something that just came in. Huh? One o'clock from traffic, item six. Uh, Dodge Coop, Mason Street Curve, 1245. Vehicle crashed through guard rail into a concrete detaining wall. Estimated speed, 50 miles per hour. Single occupant, Henry Freeholder, dead. Suicide. Yeah, that's it. Well, the motorcycle officer said he practically saw it. There was no other traffic and nobody else could have been in the car. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm? I think I got something. The stuff the doctor took off his body. Well, that's a farewell note, I suppose. No, no, no. A letter Todd Sterman wrote Henry Freeholder yesterday. Remember, Brooksy? Yeah, what's it say? Well, it's mostly about the securities, how much they probably would be worth. But here, there's a direct quote from his will. Uh, to Henry Freeholder, an exact one-third of the amount of my fortune... This request is made in full knowledge of Mr. Freeholder's past and of the single misstep he made as an accountant. Huh. Well, so our suicide was an embezzler one. Well, the records will give us the story. Sure, but this gives us a clue to motive, don't you see? Sturman's will would be probated someday. That means it would be available for the newspapers. And if a family like Francis contested the will, there'd be even more publicity. 
Mr. Freeholder had even become treasurer of his church. Huh? Yes, sir. The good, honest man wouldn't be so good anymore when this was being known, would it? Well, so what? He'd have a quarter of a million bucks, wouldn't he? Riley, my hunch is that his wife didn't feel that way about it. Yes, mm-hmm. she must have wanted him to refuse the money. Anything to hide the secret and protect their little place in their community. But dear old Henry just couldn't resist the glitter. Yeah, yeah. And he's just so unhappy about uh, fighting with his wife over it that he goes out and kills himself. Ah, but mm-hmm. Maybe you're right, Riley. It's not enough. But maybe it will be enough when I find out what kind of correspondence a box it gets. Mean anything? Francis O'Neill's address. Yeah. <laughs> Run out like he's seen the devil himself. <laughs> Miss O'Neill, do you mind if we come in? Yes. Well, thanks. Honey. I knew you didn't mind. Well, Mr. McClintock. Jack and Jill. Uh, Please, Mr. Valentine. There's no car for you. Get out of here, both of you. Look, he's wearing his chip. The again. lady don't want you here. Relax, Please. Buster. Sure, like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's different, isn't it? Suck up for a Stop. Let me get Stop. Stop. Miss O'Neill. Stop it. Oh. Come on, Miss O'Neill. George, I'll take you in the next That's room. Just cause I'm out of condition. Overweight. Maybe you never were such a great fighter. Maybe you never did knock out Tiger Jensen. What are you picking on me for? I'm not. I just want to know what kind of a paragraph you drew in old man Sturman's will. Hey, give me a third of it. Okay, keep talking. I, well, I can't. Miss Francis. It's all right. It's all right. I must tell him. Please, Mr. McClendon. It's about my big fight. It 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 says I paid Tiger Jensen to take a dive. Huh? Your one big claim to fame is a phony, isn't it? George, there's something about Miss O'Neill, too. Huh? Now, she says she'll tell us if we promise not to repeat it. What is it, Miss O'Neill? Twenty years ago, there was a young man. I cared so much for him. We had all our plans made. I had thought he was so nice. And then at the last moment, well, I... I was simply forced to reject him. And people were so kind, so sympathetic. Only... Only in Uncle's will. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Only in the will, it's just the other way around. You were the one who was children. Yes. And that's the way it fell. Just like Mr. McClendon won his fight by crookedness. And Mr. Freeholder's embezzlement that everyone had forgotten. And you're the three people that Sturman picked to leave his money to. Yes. Now that you know, you won't tell anyone, will you? You will keep our secret. You will leave us alone. I didn't promise. You see, that's why we took you in our confidence. So you'd understand. There's something you don't understand, Miss O'Neill. A slight case of suicide on the part of one Henry Freeholder. Oh, no. But now I think I'll wait till later to find out why you were the last person to see him alive. Sure, sure, as fast as I get off of this phone, but what did she say about Freeholder and what was the ex pup doing in her house? Never mind, Riley, just meet me there. Lobby of the Hotel McKinley. As soon as you can make it. George, Lieutenant Riley. Oh, lobby. Lobby, he says. The place hasn't even got a lobby anymore. Just a pile of junk. Okay, okay. The stairs are through here. Wait a second, Valentine. Listen to me. Listen. Before we go looking for eccentric millionaires, the file boys have finished their checkup. Yeah? And there's not one single whisper of embezzlement on the whole dull story of Henry Freeholder. What? Yeah, that's right. I know. What? You... You know it? Sure. And the boxer never fought a dirty fight in his life. Not even with Tiger Jensen. And as for Francis... But George, they just got through confessing to him. Angel Santa Claus told us the truth a long time ago. He gave us the answer to everything. Now, come on, let's get upstairs. We got a date to pull off his beard. I've lived in this 
room for 42 years. I was the first guest in this hotel. I'd made $10,000 and I, I bought a charm. You told us that before, Mr. Sturman. You better save your breath. The lieutenant's gone to get a doctor. Uh, those flights of stairs were too much for me, I guess. My, my heart. But I couldn't live by myself after this hotel is gone. I don't see how you ever could have lived with yourself. Uh, what, what's that? I'm talking about that fancy deal with the will. Why did you hire me in the first place? I told you to see the will would go through all right. You mean to make sure they understood their secrets would be publicized? Oh, I knew even if your sympathies were with the other people, Valentine, it wouldn't make any difference. You have your price, too. You think every man has his price, don't you? The idea isn't original with me, Miss Brooks. Listen to me, Sturman. You hate the world so much you made up those secrets, made up lies about people and put them in your will. If you want the money, you must accept the scandal. Your idea of a dying gesture was to play God. No, 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 not God. But I did play devil, Valentine. <laughs> that silly little accountant you say killed himself, freeholder, willing to sell a lifelong reputation for honesty. And the kid, the boxer, who willing to sell his pride and strength, tried in the one big thing he ever did. Francis, she lives on sympathy, doesn't she? Poor Francis. But she would have made a joke of herself for money. All for money. Every one of them. Haven't you ever met anyone who did anything just out of kindness? No. When you had your eyes open, you'd see the same thing. It's always money. Uh, look at these people. They've already told you the lies as though they were true. They already pretended for the sake of money. I just wish there was a law that would make it legal to hang you. There isn't. Anyway, I'll die soon now. Very soon. My securities will be sealed in a box. My will, it'll be probated. Then the publicity. And someone else will know what it feels like to sell your soul for silver. Someone beside me. Uncle? Miss O'Neill. Uncle, is he all right? No, he's not. <laughs> the last duty call me. I really should increase your legacy, oh, my dear. Good uncle. Mr. Valentine, I had to come. There's something I must tell you. I, I can't keep it a secret any longer. Francis. Oh, Uncle, I know. Of course I know. How could I avoid it when I've tried to help you with with handling your things? Francis, you don't you don't know. You better lie down, Mrs. Stern. Get out of my way. Francis, you want money. That's all. That's all anybody wants, isn't it? Isn't it? Please, Uncle, please. I've only tried to humor you. Tried to protect you. I didn't know you were involving anyone else in that will but me. Francis. But, but then you, you do like me. For myself. Oh, and I, my whole life, I wanted somebody did care. Oh. Oh. Maybe it's just as well. Georgie. Yeah, yes, Brooksy. Well, he wasn't the last guest. The next to the last guest. Well, Miss O'Neill, I, I guess I owe you an apology. What? It wasn't until one second ago that I realized why you've always been so curious. Why you'd followed us. Why you rushed around to see Freeholder and had the kid over at your house. Yes. I had to see them. I had to tell them. Uncle used to be wealthy, you know. But now those securities of his aren't worth a single penny. He thought, what's that? Yeah, Brooksy. The last joke of the man who played devil. Okay, Brooksy. Motive for suicide, frustrated greed. Freeholder had already made his choice and separated from his wife when Miss O'Neill caught up with him to tell him there wasn't any toe. Oh. Well, I guess I got everything. Only what about Kid McKinnon? He was all upset over taking the money. When Francis told him there really wasn't any, he stood by her, helped to pretend those lies in the will were true, helped to protect the old man. Protect him from what? The booby hatch. The old man deliberately made his worldly fortunes a nice round zero. The barns were all defaulted, the houses mortgaged. 
All for one last thumb-to-the-nose joke. Oh. What do you suppose makes a man be like Mr. Stern? Oh, I don't know, Angel. I don't know. Blindness, I guess. Not being able to see the nice people who are there all the time. People like Francis. Mm, maybe. But I bet if he weren't alone, if he were happily married... Oh, oh, oh. you aren't trying to play God, are you, Miss Brooks? No, Valentine. I, I'm just playing Cupid. And I'll succeed. <laughs> I don't believe anyone planning a vacation ever said to himself, now let's see, I better figure three or four hours for engine trouble and repairs. But that unhappy situation happens surprisingly often on vacation trips. The best preventive I know is to start giving your car the extra protection of RPM motor oil tomorrow. This premium quality oil is compounded to take care of your car's engine as no ordinary oil could possibly do. RPM cleans as it lubricates disperses sludgy carbon particles so they can't interfere with the smooth operation of close-fitting parts. RPM clings to upper cylinder walls and other hot spots left bare by ordinary motor oils. And when you cut your motor, RPM won't drip off internal parts. It stays on the job to fight off corrosive rust. No wonder RPM motor oil is first choice in the West. Get it at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say... And mean, we take better care of your car. Next week, when George Valentine and Brooksy join Lieutenant Riley at the scene of a violent death, we'll hear... Valentine, did you ever hear of a perfect crime? Hey, wait a minute, say that again. Well, this dame here got killed last night. By a gas explosion. But the gas was turned off yesterday morning. George? Yeah. Maybe that rider wasn't so nutty after all. Didn't he mention an explosion? Uh, what's that? What's just that? Just this, Lieutenant. There's a guy loose in this town who's wearing a brown suit. And it just so happens he's the lucky guy my client told how to commit a perfect crime. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Let George Do It was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Francis X. Bushman as Sturman, Lorene Tuttle as Francis, Eddie Fields as McClintock, Ruth Parrott as Mrs. Freeholder, and Tim Graham as Punchy. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. <laughs>